Welcome to What Will Happen to Energy in the Next Congress. Please welcome Diana Furch Scott Roth, Director of the Heritage Foundation Center for Energy, Climate, and Environment. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Diana Furch Scott Roth, Director of the Center for Energy, Climate, and Environment. And I want to welcome all of you to this event, those of you who are here and those of you who are online. And I've been told there are about 200 people online and more people are going to be watching via webinar. So we better be careful what we say. <laughs> We're honored to have with us today Lou Pugliarisi from EPRINC, which is the premier DC <laughs> energy mm -hmm. think tank, and Trisha Curtis with PetroNerds, the premier Colorado <laughs> energy strategy <laughs> advisory firm. <laughs> Well, over the past year ending in September, the latest data available, the price of energy has risen by about 20%. Gasoline prices rose by somewhat under 20%, fuel oil rose by 60%, and piped natural gas services rose by 33%. Data for the year ending in October are going to be published tomorrow. Uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. As all of you know, this places a serious burden on households and on the economy because the extra money spent on energy cannot be spent on other things, and so other purchases decline. Consumers use energy directly through electricity and gasoline purchases, and it's used to produce and transport other goods. Inflation and the economy are major concerns, as we've just heard in yesterday's election. And people see gasoline prices several times a day as they travel, even if they don't stop to fill up. Shortly after taking office, President Biden fulfilled his campaign promise to reduce domestic energy production in a number of ways. He canceled the Keystone XL pipeline paused federal offshore and onshore leasing, and suspended leasing in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has issued a policy inhibiting new pipeline production in the United States. The Securities and Exchange Commission and the Office of the Controller of the Currency have stated they will take into account climate risk when evaluating companies and banks' investments and this reduces capital flowing to oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear. So the question before us today is this. Can Congress help the Feds fight against inflation by encouraging further energy production? America has vast reserves of oil and natural gas, and some say that higher production would lower prices. Others say that America is producing as much as possible and that no further production is possible and even if we were to produce more, this production would not affect global prices. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. We don't know what the final makeup of Congress is going to be, but either chamber could hold oversight hearings on higher prices and production and place conditions on how funds are spent, subject to the President's signature on spending bills. Let me now introduce our two experts. Lou Pugliarisi is President of the Energy Policy Research Foundation, and he served in a wide range of government posts, including the National Security Council in the Reagan White House. At the time, I was with the Council of Economic Advisors, and we both worked on the third floor of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, along with Ollie North and mm -hmm. Fawn Hall. <laughs> Lou has also worked in the Departments of State, Energy, Interior, and EPA, and has written extensively on energy issues and testified before various committees of Congress. Tricia Curtis is the President and CEO of PetroNerd, LLC. She founded her own company and began running it in Denver in 2016. Since 2010, she has led extensive research efforts and major consulting projects. 
and authored several reports on North American upstream and midstream markets for government agencies, global think tanks, and corporations. She's globally recognized for her knowledge of U.S. shale and has been asked to speak at several forums, including OPEC in Vienna, uh, in Bahrain, and in Riyadh. She's the host of the Petro Nerds podcast. Well, each will speak for five minutes, followed by questions from the moderator, that's me, and the audience, that's you. Uh, questions from the online audience can be placed in the chat and will be relayed to me via my cell phone. So why don't we start with Lou? Yes, uh, thank you, Diana and Tricia, two, two old friends. Good to be here. Uh, so we are in this space of petroleum economics or energy economics and public policy. And over the last 100 days, I've testified about four times, both Senate and House side, on variants of this, this particular issue Diana just outlined. And so the, the short answer is yes. We, policy makes a great difference, particularly what the Congress is doing, but of course the administration. And I, I thought I'd, I'd maybe just show you two or three slides, but I'd like to start out and say, look, the North American production platform is an enormous engine of wealth creation, uh, energy security, and, and uh, prosperity for the United States. It, it, it's a central element of our national power. And strategies to undermine the operation of that platform uh, harms energy security. And within the context of the fights over climate, one of the things we try to encourage folks to think about is, it's probably not a good idea to stop producing the legacy fuels if you don't really have alternatives ready to go. Now, let me just take a look at a couple of things. I want to first thank uh, my colleague, Mac Pazur, and, and Bat Ogro for some of the help on these slides. But you can see here on this first slide that if you look at U.S., Canada, Mexico, and that's, that's really the way to look at it as an integrated market, we are net exporters to the world market. We're about 2 million barrels a day. Now, you hear a lot of discussion that the U.S. is importing crude. Yes, we are importing crude but we're also exporting a lot of products. So when you solve all the efficiencies of transportation economics, processing, and marketing, the U.S. is not a net draw, or North America is not a net draw on the world market. We're a net contributor to it. But the policies that we're following now are diminishing that role. Uh, it's also true for gas. The other thing to sort of address this uh, question that Diana raised is between 2000 and 2020, I mean 2010 and 2020, the United States provided over 80% of the net increment in demand to the world market. This is one of the reasons why prices remain so low. So we have this vast resource base. I mean, the, the gas resource base is quite amazing, but inefficiencies in the distribution of it or regulatory programs are sort of what's holding us back. Um, Finally, uh, what, I, what I'd like to, just before we get started on that, is that on the, there is a short question I'd like to say on the downstream, because the operation of this platform would be more efficient and less costly to consumers if we could get the production of gasoline and transportation fuels more in line with their cost of production instead of the sort of regulatory framework. And so the U.S. various biofuel mandates particularly the ethanol standard above 10% of the fuel supply, is spiking the compliance cost. And in fact, the, a few months ago, the Council of Economic Advisors called us and asked if they could have our data, which we gave them. And we thought for sure they would go fight it out and we'd get some rational strategy. And we, and we can talk about the, the politics of this are not good on either side of the aisle. I have the scars from Joni Ernst and Deb Fisher on ethanol, so... I'm happy to talk about this as we get to it. But there are things Congress can do, and we'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Trish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, firstly, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and these are old friends, uh, or new, new friends, and, mm -hmm. and old friends. And I had my first job with Lou Pularisi here in Denver, or, or sorry, here in D.C. I'm in Denver now. Um, but I'm going to jump into this. I'm, I mean, I'm very passionate about the industry um, and this business. And I think, you know, firstly, I'm just going to say, 
that um, this administration has this administration has been probably the most anti-domestic oil and gas production administration that we've had. And Diana pointed that out really clearly in the first days in office of, you know, in literally within the first seven days, what this administration did. And um, the question of whether or not we could actually increase production in the U.S. Um, between, there are a number of different things that could be done, you know, from a policy standpoint, um, just changing executive orders that would sort of send a signal to producers to produce more. Um, now, oil prices are obviously not, this is, they're not just high because of uh, the, the U.S. president. Um, so there's a number of factors that obviously contribute to oil prices. If we look in the previous presidency, we had lower oil prices. But if you just think about how, if you're listening to the stock market and you're hearing about how folks are talking about energy, obviously energy stocks have done really well. Now we don't know what's going on with Congress, but they're trying to figure out where is this going to go. And I would say, you know, it's positive for energy stocks if, you know, Congress could push forward infrastructure, right, if we could actually build a pipeline. That would be positive for multiple energy stocks like um, folks in the Marcellus that need to produce um, more natural gas. That would be positive. It wouldn't be positive for prices, right? It would, it would help bring down prices. That would be positive for the economy. That would be positive for um, helping lower inflation. That would help with the Federal Reserve's uh, inability to sort of hit energy. So those are just different things to think about. Um, both Diana and Lou have been on my podcast. So if you haven't listened to it, please, please do. Um, this is U.S. oil production, and I just I only point this out because we are producing 12 million barrels per day. And to Lou's point um, and Diana's point, I mean, this is we've had a steady ramp up. You can see that end where we we dropped down during COVID, and we've been climbing back. But I think it's really important important to point out on the back of Lou's comments that you know we had very low and stable oil prices um, between 2014 and 2021. In including all of 2021, we averaged 58 dollars a barrel. Um, in uh, that entire time frame. That's a pretty big deal because the whole world benefited from that low, those low prices. And we saw Germany benefit. We saw Japan benefit. We saw major industrial economies benefit from these very low and stable oil prices. And that was largely on the back of the U.S. adding massive volumes of production into the market. Now, oil companies did spend a lot of money. That wasn't necessarily a good thing. However, the point was we were able to do more with less in the industry. And that's very important to think about in these previous trajectories of prices and where we're sort of going. And it has taken the industry a while to climb back. The other point to say is that, and you don't hear this as well, you don't hear this from the administration or do you hear it from other uh, major news sources, is we're the largest producer of natural gas in the entire world. So the natural gas market is a 400 billion cubic feet per day market. We produce, our gross withdrawals in the US are 120 billion cubic feet. So we produce more than a quarter of the world's supply and demand of natural gas. That is massive, and it's on the back of a very low recount. That purple line is the recount, and you can see that we're not really targeting natural gas. We're getting all this associated natural gas from the Fermi Basin, from the Eagle Fir, from the Wilson Basin, from the DJ Basin, and that's really contributing to our ability to be able to export liquefied natural gas to folks in Europe, which is extremely important. Um, we're also just doing a lot more with less. So we're, we have longer laterals. I mean, during COVID, as with every downturn, we get smarter, we get better, and we've incrementally drilled a lot longer laterals over the course of two years, which means you need less rigs. Um, so we have a lot of efficiency. Um, I'm just going to back this up to you know the White House and the SPR. I think this is extremely important. Um, we started at about 640 million barrels. Um, that was about 32 days of cover, and we have about 400 million barrels, and so we've lost about 10 days of cover on the SPR. That's not typically what you use the SPR for. You don't use it um, to lower oil prices and to um, buy votes. You use it because you have a shortfall of oil. Um, and lastly, I'm just going to say permit approvals. This is permit approvals on federal land. So the point that Diana was making of that executive order 14008 on climate change, which was enacted in day seven of this administration, basically suspended all permitting on federal land. Um, and, or, or sorry, the first day we suspended all permitting on federal land, then they renewed it. But you can see that is pre-Biden is in red and post-Biden is in blue. And you can see those federal permit approvals have really come down. And so something you see a lot on TV is, hey, well, we have 9,000 permits. If you want to drill, just go drill them. Well, you know, it, it doesn't, geology doesn't quite work that way. You know, you just because just you have a permit doesn't mean you want to necessarily drill that well and you have to test it out. But the point is that the permit approvals have really come down and you're re-upping. So if you have an existing permit, you cannot re-up that permit. And there has been no administration until now that has not re-approved existing permits. That's never happened. So now we're not doing that. Um, and our lease sales, to Diana's point, have 
um, actually, between the ones that have been canceled and the ones that have been approved, they basically equal nothing. So we haven't had any federal lease sales. So when you think of business signaling to the market of where we're taking this business, you can't really beg the you can't really beg these oil companies, hey, produce now, because the signal from the beginning two years ago was, hey, we're not in favor of you. And two years is a long enough time frame to impact oil and gas production. Um, so if the administration had done different things in the very beginning, I think we would have a different outcome. And that being said, we are still producing 12 million barrels per day. So with that, I'm just going to leave it, and then we can go to questions and discussion. Well, let me start with this. Uh, given that we know the House of Representatives is going to be Republican, we're not going to have a windfall profits tax because taxes start in the House of Representatives. So we know that that's off the table. What do you think, Kong, and that's, uh, that's beneficial because then oil companies can use these funds uh, to reinvest in production if they're able to do that. What else do you both think that Congress could do in order to increase energy production? Why don't we start with you, Lou, and then Sure. I, I think I, I thought Trisha's points were, were on, on the mark. So what we actually, we testified on this. Take the renewable fuel standard for ethanol down to 10 percent. And can you explain to us what so the yes, renewable that, fuel yeah, standard and I, is? Because I'm reluctant. If I asked another person to write a paper on ethanol in our group, they would quit. But <laughs> let me just say that uh, the Congress has a series of biofuel mandates. These mandates are not based on market conditions. They're just, you know, they, were, they were signed during the Bush administration, and they, they, they were directed at somehow increasing the fuel supply in the United States by requiring higher levels of biofuels in the production of transportation fuels. Now, it turns out like ethanol is a valuable blend stock for gasoline, and it works pretty well. And if we had no regulations in place now, we could probably blend at 10 percent. And we're actually fighting over a small volume because we've never blended much above 10 percent. But the, the way the regulations work, you see biodiesel and cellulosic and all these advanced programs, they're probably adding 30 cents a gallon. The farmers aren't getting very much out of this. But the, you just can't, you know, the politics of this are kind of bad on both sides of the aisle. And it's, it's really hard to fix. But it's, it's a tragedy because we could actually probably bring down gasoline prices. The other issue is that we have balkanized the specifications for gasoline. So this adds to uh, increases in distribution costs. And part of this is something called RVP, reed vapor pressure, having to do with precursors. It's a local pollution issue. I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but there'd be enormous benefits to having a single standard for the country. And then we also have our favorite is the Jones Act. It provides a lot of inefficiencies. Uh, the Jones Act is a restriction requiring you to use U.S. Uh, flagged, generally U.S. constructed and U.S. flagged union tankers to move products from one American port to another. This is a perennial fight and problem, but the unions have a lot of juice on this, and it's really hard to fix. So on the downstream side, there are things we could do. On the upstream side, I couldn't agree more with uh, Tricia. It's very important to send signals that we're going to have an expansive oil and gas uh, production policy. And we can do that and at the same time create a lot of wealth and a lot of income to state and local governments. In fact, I've been quite shocked about, let me leave, there was a lease sale in New Mexico on federal land. It generated, I think it was December of 2020, generated about a billion dollars. This is like net economic rent, which came to the federal government. But under U.S. law, $500 million of that was kicked back to the state of New Mexico. Now, you could argue that this production is a bad thing, you know, it's horrible and stuff. But that $500 million that went to the state of Mexico was pure economic rent. They could build opioid clinics, hospitals, roads. They could improve their schools. And so there's a real failure in the policy process to say, yeah, we don't really like this oil and gas, but we're not, we, we don't really want to talk about the benefits that actually at local communities get that we're willing to forego. So it's, it's really sort of fuzzed up in the political process. And a lot more education needs to be done to understand what we're missing out on. Um, so I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that, because those are, I think, excellent comments. Um, and I think, so there's a couple things I want to show you. And that's, you know, just to lose point, I'm going to come back to refining in a little bit and what we can do on the production side. So 
What Congress could do, I think, firstly, is um, changing the conversation is important. So we have had zero pushback on the administration, by and large. Um, I don't think there's been enough vocal critics. I mean, the fact that Joe Manchin is a Democrat and is the MVP for the Republican Party on pushing back on Joe Biden on energy is a big deal. Um, and he has, you know, sort of bent the knee and, um, and went ahead with the Inflation Reduction Act, which obviously didn't reduce inflation, um, in hopes that, a, you know, a pipeline might get built. Um, but a pipeline getting built is super critical in terms of actually move forward. You, you, the Marcellus is capped at production right now and is the most prolific, one of the most prolific natural gas sources in the entire world. Can you tell people where the Marcellus shale is? Because yes. some of them might not know. Absolutely. So Appalachian Basin is your, your, your uh, Ohio... Pennsylvania, it goes into New York as well. You can't obviously frack in, in New York and produce, but Pennsylvania is very significant in terms of production. I'm gonna go meet up with the client um, right after I do this tomorrow in Pittsburgh, um, it, who works actually in the Marcellus. Um, so that's right in there and it, you're right near Virginia, you're on the East Coast and massive amount, we're talking you know, 10, 20, 30 BCF a day. The wells produce you know, 15,000 cubic feet per day on average well when they come online. So, Huge prolific natural gas basin. The problem is, is that we need this Jones Act waiver to actually move liquefied natural gas from the Gulf Coast of the U.S. all the way up to the East Coast right now because the East Coast doesn't have the infrastructure to get the gas that's sitting on their doorstep because you cannot build a pipeline. And we can't actually increase the production in the Marcellus because we can't, um, we haven't been able to build a pipeline. And that's, that, that was pre-Joe Biden that has been happening for multiple presidents where we've had massive, not in your, my backyard, NIMBYism issues. Um, but I just want to point out that if you look at New Mexico and you look at just state production, um, that, that yellow line there is California. That's a steady decline down. Every month, California loses production. That purple line that's next to that yellow line is Colorado. That's up and down. Massive regulatory impacts in Colorado from significant permit permitting issues. Um, and when Jared Pulse came into office, we really saw production come off a cliff. Um, New Mexico, that line, New Mexico is producing 1.6 million barrels per day. That is more than small OPEC countries, and that is two counties, Lee and Eddy County in New Mexico alone. Two small counties, a fraction of those counties, um, largely on federal land, are producing mass amount of oil. This is some of the best rock in the entire world is located right there. And these guys drilled throughout COVID um, and have really just ratcheted up. And it's, it's extremely impressive in terms of just what we can do. And so when everybody says, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, the US industry is done and the production is not gonna come back, you know, we hear a lot about that gets a little bit influenced from you know, maybe what the Saudis say and, and what we hear on the East Coast, but that's not what's actually happening on the ground. And so when people say, what could this administration or what could Congress do to actually, could we increase production? There's a lot. For the, from the technical rock perspective, the rock is not done giving, you, but you do have to have a lot of things like the Jones Act, you know, waivers, uh, building a pipeline, signaling that we're going to build out infrastructure. Because what happens is that if you don't have the pipeline capacity, you have uh, differential blowouts, the price drops, and you can't produce this stuff. And right now the price is great, so everybody's producing, but we are starting to hit some log jam. We're going to start hitting some issues with natural gas pipe capacity. And then that means that are you going to have to flare natural gas and then you can't produce it. So um, there's a number of different things I can get into it. Um, but uh, I will, I'll pause right there. What would you both say to people who say, uh, okay, Tricia, okay, Lou, I believe you, we can produce more, but it's not going to affect prices on the global market because they're set on the global market and the United States does not have the power to bring down oil prices. What would you say to the, so those it's, people? First, it's a repudiation of 150 years of economic theory. But I mean, if we produce more, I mean, it's kind of Occam's law, right? If the problem is the price is high, you need more supply. Right, and, and I think that what they're saying is that the United States cannot add enough to the global supply to bring down the global price. So, That's what they're yeah, saying. Yeah, so, so there's a question of timing here. Right? So uh, people have a lot of problem with understanding the role of expectations. So if you look at the market now, they say it's highly backward dated, right? So that, that just means that the, the price in the future is either the price in the sort of speculative market, if you like, or in the forward market is lower than it is now. But the, the real question there is, if you think about the futures market, it's really, the, what it really does is move supplies through time, mm -hmm. right? It moves supplies through time. And what we're trying to do is move supplies from the future closer to now. We do that through inventory adjustments and stuff. But if we're sending a signal, as Tricia pointed out, that look, the future is going to be kind of pessimistic for 
U.S. production. There are other problems around the world. If the Europeans are sending these signals out that we're not going to develop our resources, and in fact we're enabling OPEC, I always say the best counter OPEC strategy is just to produce more. It's a traditional antitrust problem. Produce more here, oh, the dynamics within those who are controlling the market will shift. Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult argument to make to the public. It's a really hard argument to explain to the Congress. <laughs> but we have to change expectations. Mm -hmm. If we change expectations, even though your supply and demand calculations may not yield much in terms of the math you do now, it can't begin to shift uh, uh, consumers, uh, buyers and sellers in the market and make a big effect on prices. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no doubt if the U.S. had an expansive policy in which we knew more oil was coming, more gas was coming, more LNG was coming on the market, long-term contracts, lots of things would start to happen. It would take some time, but... Mm -hmm. Trisha. Yeah, so I mean, there's, it's, I think it's multifaceted and multifold. And I do think there's an inherent bias in the, uh, well, you can't, we just can't increase production. And we heard this, we heard this years ago when, when Obama and, and, um, was campaigning. I mean, we heard this in the debates of, could we increase net, could we increase production? And the people would say, well, it takes six months to a year. Now, I'm third generation oil and gas. I grew up around the business. And I know how long it takes to drill a well and bring the stuff online. You can impact the market pretty quickly. If you can get on television and say, we're releasing more S PR barrels and, and the hope of reducing you know, prices, trust me, you can get on television and say, we're building Keystone Excel, we're going to build some pipelines, and we're open for business. It will drop oil prices just because you're doing that. So there's a couple things with oil prices, I think. We have seen a massive drop in traded volumes in both the West Texas Intermediate WTI contracts, and you know I don't like to harken back to the Saudis, but they have made some points on the thinness of trading, and they're in Brent volumes as well. It is very thin. If you look at 2022, it, we have really dropped off trading volumes. And so the actual traded volumes are not quite reflecting reality right now. And we're getting dislocations in local crews and WTI, all kinds of things happening there. So there are some issues going on with actual contracts because we're not trading it. And that's because we do have some liquidity issues in the market. Um, when you're trading on London Metals Exchange and nickel's going crazy, that pulls money out of oil. Um, secondly, you know, and I learned this from Lou because we spent a lot of time doing ethanol and refining, but refinery capacity really does matter. And, you know, this is a chart that just shows the U.S. refinery capacity um, and gasoline and diesel prices. And we have lost a, we've lost over a million barrels a day refining capacity in the U.S. alone. Collectively, globally, we've lost a few million barrels a day. And tell but, us what these lines mean. Yes, what's so the red line? That what's red the blue line, line? What's the gray line? That red line is U.S. refining capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see where it was topped over 18 million barrels a day, and that has come offline. So we've lost a million barrels a day. And those gray and black lines, that's your average diesel price and your average gasoline price. And you can see there is a, a pretty decent correlation in terms of that moving up. Now, globally, we set, you know, there's three major refining hubs the Gulf Coast, um, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and Singapore, that sort of helps set oil prices. So people forget that refined product prices help influence oil prices. And when we have COVID, just put the nail in the coffin in terms of very low refining margins and lots of refiners went out of business. Add to that, so we have lost refining capacity, you've got France having strikes at refineries, and then add to that, you know, we haven't lost a lot of Russian oil production on the market, but we have lost Russian refined product, a few hundred thousand barrels a day that's not going on the waters. Um, and same for China. China's not a few hundred thousand barrels a day. So add up a few hundred thousand barrels a day, a few hundred thousand barrels a day, start the numbers start adding up. And then you're talking about a tight market. Well, we're seeing gasoline demand in the U.S. pretty flat. Diesel demand has been relatively strong. And remember, the economy in the world runs on diesel. Your railroads are running on diesel. Your ships are running on diesel, everything. So that's eventually going to slow. But the point is, is that it's a bit out of whack. And so these prices are really serious. And I mean, when I was starting out with Lou, we were going to the East Coast and telling refiners that they could take Bach and crude. And we were you know, helping entities, telling them, don't shut down these refineries. And that has to do more than just Congress. It has to be states saying, incentivizing, not shutting down refiners. So California has a major role to play in this. You can't be incentive, you can't be anti oil and gas and shutting down these refineries. And that gets me to my last point of I think it, ESG and the the um, the comments that Diana was making with the SEC um, and the regulatory environment and where the U.S. comes out guns blazing and saying you know we're we're going to produce less and and we're going toward green. It really does matter because this is a trickle down effect. And if everybody is you know has these tailwinds and they're very excited about all these green investments which aren't making money and they're not producing money, and they're even incentivizing oil and gas companies to, produce, to take 
billions of dollars and to put it in lower carbon, that lower carbon is lower energy, has a lower BTU output, and that is impacting the consumers today here in America and all over the world because everyone has put those dollars into lower energy output. And we are feeling the ramifications of that today. So it's something that, you know, the U.S. can have a profound impact on it, but the world needs to, you know, really have a come to Jesus moment that we have to be producing energy and a lot more than we're producing now. Another thing we hear is that we cannot expand refinery capacity in the United States in the short term because it is already at the max. And if we built a new refinery, which we haven't done for decades, it would be five years or so before it was online. So if we are really capped at refinery capacity, uh, how can we lower prices? So um, first, the structure of the production process. I, I think the refining stuff is a little tricky because for many years we had too much capacity in the North Atlantic Basin, right? Mm -hmm. So we had some inefficient facilities that had to be shut down. How, and I, I'm actually parsing all out is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to parse out all the forces. It's clear to me that the pandemic shutting down really made it difficult to recover quickly. There's a lot of things you could do to tune up some of the refineries. But um, we don't really, I mean, we had a period of very high crack spreads, but we also had, with, you know, this, what crack so a crack spread means? is the margin between what you pay for the crude oil and what you can sell the products for, right? And that just took off. It had to do with a, huge, a lot of distortions, which now are being exacerbated. If you think about it, it's a little more tricky. What happens is natural gas prices shot up, right? The Asians are pushing back their natural gas. Mm -hmm. but people are then having to shift to coal and diesel, right? The Saudis, I mean, they use, I think, two to 300,000 barrels a day in direct crude burn in their utility system because the relative price of gas. So you had this question of when gas prices spiked, natural gas prices, it began to put more pressure on the diesel market, in particular in Asia and the Middle East. And so it's all sort of related <laughs> to a policy that doesn't have enough volume of oil and gas in the world market. And that was last, um, so if you, if you go back and you look at energy prices last fall um, in September, when we saw that price spike of oil, that was because we had the fuel switching where natural gas prices spiked and everybody was switching from natural gas in the power plant to diesel. And so that was the media, a beginning of this in addition to lost this, we lost this refining capacity, so we lost this diesel. And then the Saudis, he's 100% right, 200, 300,000 barrels a day on a daily basis. In the summertime, they burn a million barrels a day. And they were able to do something amazing. They swapped, they were able to put that oil on the market because um, they were using Russian fuel oil um, to burn instead, which was nice and convenient for them. Um, but the point is, is that this is a lot, we've had a massive amount of consumption of diesel in the power sector. And so for all this, you know, let's go green and our aggressive green policies in Europe over the past 10 years, they are burning diesel like mad in their power plants because natural gas prices were too high. Now we've just seen a little bit of a flipping where, where prices have come down. But the point is we're seeing the direct crude burn for diesel has been huge. And that is certainly impacting us. And that's, again, on the back of COVID when Europe really let their production decline significantly for natural gas, for oil. Um, everybody let the refining capacity come offline. Um, and so now we're sort of at the problem. But they are all extremely, extremely interconnected, to lose point. Let's open it up for questions. Uh, do we have any questions here? And if so, wait for the mic. Uh, Myron Ebel, let's wait for the mic. If you could identify yourself and your organization and ask a question rather than a comment, that would be terrific. So many, so many conditions. Uh, Myron Ebel, CEI. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear that American production has remained buoyant despite the best efforts of the Biden administration to uh, depress it and destroy the industry. But I'm wondering actually what Congress, the 118th Congress, can do. And I just wonder if you would talk about uh, two aspects that occurred to me. One is the appropriations process. And the second is uh, all these financial regulations that you mentioned, uh, the ESG, the SEC rule, the attempt to drive investment out of uh, conventional energy and say you can't do it anymore, or you can't invest it. Because obviously, if we can't invest in it, production is going to start going down, right? So let, first, let's talk about FERC, because the chairman is uh, been renominated by the administration, I believe, 
And I think Tell us what FERC is oh, and what it does. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, does. which uh, is the fundamental regulator in interstate gas pipelines, not necessarily, and uh, also very active in the movement of uh, regulation of electricity across the United States. And I have a commission, the independent commission, and uh, as anyone who's watched the hearings knows that uh, Senator Manchin was quite upset with the chairman. He was applying, he felt, a lot of standards which were not in the law, and he's h held up his, his hearing. I think the hearing is now scheduled for Glick. So one thing is you could, that hearing process could, you know, presumably Manchin's going to torture him. We'll see what happens, whether he's, will, he's moved a bit, he's pulled back some of the more onerous regulations, so it can have an effect. effect. Uh, we, I, I thought... Oversight, when the uh, the Chenier facility, I think it was Freeport, lost its, uh, it had a fire, mm -hmm. and they needed to do a complete root cause analysis. In any rational system, when you looked at the value of that gas, you would have sent the PHMSA team to work 24 hours at the site. You would have just dedicated them down there to find the root cause, to get the regulatory hurdles out of the way so you could get that gas, that LNG, back on the water. There are things the administration can do, but I think fundamentally, it's a, the administration, there's a real problem, unless they begin to feel the heat from Congress. So the oversight hearings is a way to go. Unfortunately, the election results last night, I don't think are serious enough for the administration to alter its uh, attitude towards this. They have a fundamental view that the path to net zero is to halt the production of the legacy fuels now. And, th and there's some magical thinking that you will have some substitutes. And so it's, I, th I just think this is going to be a long, hard political slot. We have a question. Uh, well, let's take a, an online question first, and then we will go to you. Uh, the online question is, what about the long-term ecological issues? Aren't you concerned about the ecological issues in other words, the ecological problems from producing more oil and natural gas. So That's the what could be worse than halting natural gas, which is now encouraging the Chinese to expand their coal facilities at a very rapid rate? So there is a problem. You know, there's sort of this abandonment of marginal analysis which I, I've never, uh, for somehow, I always said, well, what's the matter with almost net zero? Why do we have to have net zero? How about almost net zero? There must be, I mean, you know, Nordhaus did this big piece years ago. He was a very darling of the climate people for a while till he said, well, <clears throat> I looked at the marginal analysis. I think you shouldn't spend, you should keep spending till it rises to six and a half degrees. You know, he sort of did this, the math on this, you could argue whether it's, it's relevant at all, I mean, it, it, given the uncertainties. And so, at a minimum, the administration should be embracing expanding natural gas, putting a lot more LNG on the water, because that is the way to price it, to get the price down, to encourage particularly the growing Asian economies to use more gas and less coal. And they want to do that for local, not for climate, but for local air pollution. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have a fundamental misunderstanding of both the scale and the cost challenge of the energy transition. And, and so in my sense, that's the, it's a kind of limitation in how to think about this problem as a global solution rather than. Mm -hmm. I would say that eco, I'm, so if you want to solve, for, if you're concerned about ecology, if you're concerned about the environment, firstly, China has a whole eco ecology so We're division. all concerned about the environment. Um, we all want cleaner air and right. cleaner water. And as uh, society's incomes rise, they have a greater demand for clean air and cleaner water. Right. So the way you do that, though, and, and I think, I mean, most folks in Denver and the oil and gas industry are, are pretty hardcore environmentalists. Um, no one's no one's anti you know clean air, but you cannot do that by if if you're going to outsource your production to Saudi Arabia and to Iran and to Venezuela and to Russia, um, you are um, automatically increased your emissions immediately because you're literally transporting it uh, via diesel tanker to your country and you don't have control over that production. We have the highest NOx and SOx regulations in the entire world in the U.S. We have the highest some of the highest air emission standards in Colorado for oil and gas producers. So, I mean, you can't, you can't say that we're anti, we don't want to produce it here.
here, but we want to still consume it, but we want to produce it somewhere else. It just, that's absolute BS when it comes to the ecology. Secondly, when it comes to China, you can't, you know, China's producing 400 million tons of coal. They've increased coal output by 100 million tons in five years. They have over 3,000 active um, coal-fired power plants, and they are adding 200 are in construction now, 200 are pre-permitted, and about 200 are, are going to be permitted, or are actually permitted. Their coal-fired power generation is ramping up. It has nothing to do with natural gas or the ecology or the environment. It is completely about energy security. And that's something that they are focused on. And we have to really understand energy security is so important. Um, when we are outsourcing, we're saying, OK, we're, we have to think about the ecology, which is important. You still have to think about energy security because what we've seen in Europe is an is a entity of countries that consume 55 billion cubic feet per day of gas, and they produce 20 billion cubic feet per day. And that gap in production and consumption has been completely outsourced to Russia and has given them all the leverage that they needed to do everything that they're doing. And so you can't have policies that say, we are going to, um, we're going to produce less, but we're still going to consume what we're going to consume. It just doesn't work that way. And politicians are not willing to say we're going to cut consumption because that would devastate your economy, as we saw with COVID. So it just, it's not going to happen. So we have to have very sound policies. And when you produce it at home, you have the ability to regulate it, and it is, it's significantly cleaner. And we have massive, you know, when we're pushing this industry in the U.S. to reduce methane emissions, they're doing it. I mean, so we have our standardization, our ability to regulate it at home, and that's why buying it from Canada, you, Keystone Excel, everything, you actually, these are the countries in the developed world that actually have the regulatory you know, framework to do this, as opposed to you know, just having it from abroad. And that's what's going on with China. And I would say to your question on, on Congress, and I think education is huge. So Congress needs to start having at least some kind of hearings and committee and talking about what to do, but also pushing states. States have to, like, we have to increase our refining capacity or bring refineries back. I mean, states have uh, a capacity to do this. But you think about what the Obama administration, when they passed um, through just a bill, when, when we were allowed to export crude oil, those things could happen. Um, and that's sort of the give and take of could we get a little bit of buy-in? Could we get a pipeline built? You know, could we get a pipeline built out of the Marcellus? And that's something that Congress could have an impact on um, that I'm hoping for. Great. Uh, over here. Is he going to bring them? Yep. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Walters, University of Maryland. How important would a campaign in Congress be to de-demonize carbon dioxide? Let's start with you, Tricia. Uh, undemonize uh, carbon dioxide as the enemy of, uh, undemonizing carbon dioxide as the enemy of the climate. You know, the carbon dioxide that we right. drink uh, in right. our soda water and that we, right. uh, you know, um, breathe out. I think it would, be, uh, it would be incredible. I'm not sure. I mean, it would be great if that would be an initiative just to bring some sanity to, I think, energy policy and understanding energy and understanding CO2. Um, I don't think it's likely because if uh, everyone's sort of hammering in on, on this is about CO2 emissions, I think it would be helpful just to get the conversation because this is clearly not about CO2 emissions because all these efforts that everyone is doing, if they were about reducing CO2, would be producing more energy at home. So it's clearly not about CO2. Um, so it would be helpful to get the conversation going. And I think if more people were just actually talking about what are we trying to do with this whole the net zero thing, which has literally become so politicized with the International Energy Agency um, and ludicrous um, and doesn't actually do much. I mean, we have to have people start calling this stuff out and saying, this, th what are you actually doing? Is it real? If you look at all the net zero ambitions by all the utility companies, uh, EIA has put out a great chart on this. All the things utility companies are doing around all our country, shutting down coal-fired power generation, shutting down power plants. Um, the impact on CO2 is, is a, like, we're talking single-digit percentage. It's so, so small. And CO2, the oil and gas production in America, contributes 1% of CO2 emissions in America. So when you hear all these oil companies talking about net zero by 2050, there is a lot of BS in there because if it's 1% of CO2 emissions, it is not a drop in the bucket. We're not talking about really impact emissions. It's all for ESG standards and long only and portfolios and all these things. And that's this, this reality check that we need to have about what are we actually trying to solve for and how do we actually do it. Do you have anything to add? Well, yeah, I, it's, it's, a hard, it's, it's a hard game. I mean, I've been up the hill a lot and you just... I think, you know, sort of in terms of our interests, we have just put almost all our effort saying, look, even if the entire OECD goes to net zero, which it will not, the, the, you know, the, the net effect on global emissions in 2050 is, is relatively small. 
without having a strategy that deals with the growing economies of Asia and Africa, where you have the population and the economic growth. You know, we know it's hot in Indonesia. Everybody would like an air conditioner, and they're going to buy one. And if you talk to the local, we've had a long-term project with our Japanese sister think tank on this, and everywhere we traveled in Asia, they all said, look, yeah, we're for net zero, but all of the political people you talk to say, we can't do anything that raises the price of electricity too much, because then we're, even if we're a somewhat authoritarian regime, we're probably going to be out of business. So we, we have this OECD-centric attitude towards uh, net zero and towards climate is a big, big problem. And I think the Congress can play a role in sort of pointing this out, educating it, and say, look, we need a strategy to get on the low end of the cost gradient for this. Let's take another online question, and then we will go to you, if you still have your question. Mm -hmm. How will the new makeup of Congress affect the outlook for refilling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? In part, to both your points, this would help bring up the WTI forward curve. Yes, so I'm not sure. The SPR, so I, I ran into the, a former, in Tokyo, former EIA administrator, and I was sort of, sort of bemoaning the problem of using this as a kind of piggy bank every time prices went up. And uh, what he told me was, look, you don't understand. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is very useful because it gives, Cong it gives the administration something to do when they would choose something much worse. So maybe it's really a kind of solve to, to a political thing to keep Congress from, you know, windfall profits tax and all these more horrible things. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know what we do about the SPR. I, I'm against using it willy-nilly every time the market prices move around. Well, I thought it was only supposed to be used in cases of national security. Yes, and by the way, I also heard that the Jones Act was only supposed to be waived in cases of national security. Yeah, it's very tough to waive the Jones Act. It can be done. It has been done. Yeah. The president has a lot of authority. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, the, the, international, the IE, IEEP, the International Energy Economic Policy Act, is that what it is? And, and these emergency measures give the president enormous authority mm -hmm. on this stuff, for good and bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, our basic point, uh, yes, we should refill the SPR. Uh, we should have a, uh, a, storage a storage supply that's higher than we have now, because we could have, just think about it, what happens if... Uh, the Saudi oil fields blow up. What if there's a major war between Iran and Saudi Arabia? We're going to want to have a lot of oil in storage to smooth the pathway to mm -hmm. a <coughs> to a much higher price uh, outcome. So, which and that's I think why you're seeing oil prices. I mean, there's a big uh, there's a big <coughs> geopolitical risk premium still on oil prices right now. I mean, the, I don't think the fundamentals are really reflecting you know these high 80s or even 90s. However. That being said, the SPR, um, it's just sort of like these canceled pipelines, right? Keystone XL, we didn't really feel it, and we didn't really feel canceled uh, natural gas pipelines because we had low prices. Now we have high prices on natural gas. We have pretty high prices on oil, and now these canceled pipelines are really kind of coming home to roost. We, um, you know, we end up in the U.S. and uh, really all of the world, you sort of overbuild in pipeline capacity. And that is great for the producers because they have lots of flexibility in how they move their product and it gets to market. And it's a huge portion of, you know, it's a piece of the midstream sector a lot of people don't pay attention to of how m oil and natural gas and even refined product flows. And it's really critical um, in America to how it helping set prices. So it's something that we're feeling now. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is, I think you got to hearken it and liken it back to, it's a little bit analogous to that, is that we aren't feeling it now, but we have, that 200 million barrels is a lot. No one's done that. No, no president in history has ever attempted to do that. So one, and I, I am just Godsmacked, the gobsmacked that we don't hear criticism on CNBC or Bloomberg when the president gets up and says, okay, we're doing this release, and nobody's saying, holy crap, this is really bad policymaking. Because right now, if we don't feel it, 
to Lou's point, we, we have this geopolitical risk premium, and if we lose any barrels abroad, we're going to need to tap into this because we may actually need it. Or to say we have an outage in the U.S. If we have a bit, what if there was something that happened in the Permian Basin or in North Dakota or something, and we actually lose a couple million barrels of production or something in Canada or anywhere, you have this as a, the reason why it's strategic. So I think it's really important to think about that, and globally as well, is why it's really important that democratic countries who have allowed their output to decline have really put the entire world at risk in terms of geopolitical power and also in energy security. So we need to be pushing not just the U.S., but we need to be pushing all these democratic countries who have high standards on methane and emissions to be producing as much as they possibly can, because we cannot leave it to Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Iran um, and Russia to be producing this and just us at, the, at you know, taking the knee and consuming it. Last question. Please identify yourself and your organization. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name's Tara. I work at Treasury. Um, I wanted to ask on what you think the price effects, like the global price effects of the, um, A, the service ban, the potential service ban, and B, the proposed price cap would be. So the, we've done some work on the price cap, to me, uh, it's, it strikes me as something drawn on the faculty lounge somewhere, okay? It doesn't really make a lot, uh, it's so easy to avoid that, and, the, and, and I, so I'm more, the more interesting question is, what's the, are you talking about the sort of uh, sanctions on Russia on, on technology and foreign service companies? Right. Oh, insurance. Yeah, the insurance also is a problem, although that can be, you know, the Indians and the Chinese could probably self-insure. I think that's what's going to be happening anyway. I do think the more interesting question is the export controls and what has happened, you know, what, you know, to try to get the service companies that have worked in Russia into the room and ask them, well, how, do you, how fast do you think the Russian production is going to deteriorate? What does it mean long term? I mean, th these are actually really important issues. Uh, we, we have done a big project for the Defense Department on failure modes of the energy transition. And uh, I think one of the things that came out we're not turning China or Russia into North Korea. Okay? That's just, they're just too big. It's not going to happen. We don't really have an idea how it's going to play out long term. But we do have a sense that there are multiple failure modes to the energy transition. And the consequences of them are quite severe. We haven't really planned for them very well. I would say to date, we haven't seen, so we haven't seen Europe actually reduce, um, hardly anyone really reduce consumption of, of Russian oil and natural, or Russian oil and natural gas, um, except for obviously natural gas that they've cut off themselves to Europe. Um, Europe has still consumed all that oil, and um, that's where, and Russia has maintained revenues largely from oil. They get a fraction of the revenues from natural gas. So they maintain the revenues. India and China are getting, you know, tons of Russian crude oil at a sig significant discount. And we've also seen, I mean, so there's an incentive there. Uh, China's been getting, is getting a million and a half barrels a day from Iran, who's under sanctions, and has been doing that for, for the, a couple of years. So it, China doesn't care about anybody's sanctions. So we have to get that clear. China is funding this war in Ukraine. That needs to be clear as well. So when we talk about putting price caps on Russia, which, again, when they talk about it in Europe and they talk about it here, I, it literally, it, it's little people scribbling stuff on napkins because it makes no sense. And it, it's basically, I think the administration and all these European counterparts want to keep the Russian oil flowing, but they want to penalize them. Well, that's not exactly what the Russians want, um, obviously. And you have a, putting a price cap on it, it's just saying, hey, we'll buy your crew, but it's at this price point. They've been discounting it for $35 a barrel. I mean, the market sort of works itself out. So I think the problem was that they, they wanted it lower. We haven't set it. I don't think it's going to really work. Um, and when you put prices of something too low, it will incentivize the use. So it, it, it very much flies in the face of everything Europe and the U.S., claims that they're doing on CO2 um, because it's going to incentivize use if that price is lower. And we have not seen production in Russia, and there's lots of question marks, but we have not seen a material decline. We've definitely seen you know, a shift down and OPEC plus coming out with their reductions. I think it's a little bit of cover to reduce Russian output because they knew that was sort of coming. So that helps a little bit. Um, but it's not, I would say it's, I mean, it's meaningful and it's something to watch carefully, but it's not, um, no, one's, no one's done anything substantive on it yet. Well, we're getting close to the end of our hour, and I'd like to give our panelists each a couple of minutes to wrap up. Why don't we start with you, Tricia? 
Oh, great. Um, I, I mean, there's not much more to wrap up here in saying that, you know, I think the U.S., um, and I'm going to, you know, hearken to loose terms, U.S. has an incredible production platform base. Um, I think that the things that people have not focused enough on are probably the influence of ESG, the influence of um, what is coming from New York and the pipeline of the Security Exchange Commission and the influence of the markets in um, signaling that we're anti-oil and gas and the impact that has on investment by companies to produce oil and gas. I think that's really, really critical. The education just on CO2, on energy, on what we're actually trying to accomplish um, doesn't exist and people really need to be talking about that more. Um, and I would say the ability, we, we have to get across that we have to produce it, produce um, not just domestic oil and gas, but uh, democratic oil and gas. Um, if you're going to consume it, you need to produce it um, because you cannot be outsourcing this to everyone else. So that's huge from an energy security standpoint. And lastly, I would say we have the capacity to do this. So whether it's if we built a single pipeline out of the Marcellus, if we um, you know increased output on, if we were able to send more you know LNG you know molecules abroad, all of this has a meaningful, meaningful impact in terms of denting what's going on in the global space and also impacting our, our capacity and our prices. And natural gas prices are pretty high in the US, electricity prices are soaring, and the ability to bring you know, those costs down are, are reliant on us building out infrastructure uh, to match the production capacity. And that infrastructure signal is going to allow producers to uh, pump up their production as well. And that all comes back to signaling that, hey, we're open for business. Thank you, Tricia. Lou. Yeah, so, you know, there really is a huge disconnect between what sort of the casual or the interested climate uh, public understands about how energy is produced, distributed, how emissions are dealt with, and uh, what a more technocratic approach to the problem would yield as a, as a solution. And until so, so this, I, I can't really understand why people lose their minds over this issue. I really try to understand because if you're subject, if you sort of look into it, there's some reasonable things you could do. But really, this, the real problem is this disconnect with the sort of the interested public in climate and what the sort of what's really happening on the ground. Until we sort of bridge that gap, I, I think this is going to be a a struggle and a slog to, to get some rationality out of the process. I know that's not very hopeful, but well, we do, we do have something. We've tried this ourselves. We produce something called the Chart of the Week. Anyone who wants to get us our subscription to the Chart of the Week, one small issue we distribute on Capitol Hill and around the country, and we've tried to just educate folks on one small piece of the energy complex at a time. Lou, how can they sign up for your chat? Uh, you can talk week? to Will Pack. He's no, but right people here. on our online <laughs> audience. Uh, just write or Will P at eprink.org. Okay, that's Will P, P at, at eprink.org. Yes, and he'll 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 make sure you get on the distribution. <laughs> and Tricia, how can people get in touch with your product and get, uh, and get you linked just, up with your podcast? Yep, you can find Petronerds on if you put Petronerds into your Apple on your uh, Apple podcast, it's on YouTube. Um, and if you just do Petronerds podcast or type in Petronerds, you're going to come to my website and you're going to find it. And there is a slug of uh, I, I mean, I, I obviously consult and advise, but I do try to do as much as I can for uh, you know free and put out that podcast is completely. Um, I don't take sponsorship for it, so it's just uh, raw intel, and there's a ton of information in there. <laughs> okay, well, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our online audience, and for all of you who are here, there's a reception with lunch with our speakers uh, up in the lounge to your left as you exit. So let's give our speakers a big hand.